Thanks, Anand. That's uh, very nice of you. And uh, I'm going to start by acknowledging this wonderful picture that um, uh, Mori Fujita uh, produced for this uh, little mini symposium uh, celebrating the 30th anniversary of the first GPI structures. And I was so impressed that I, I bought the T-shirt. So that's a uh, <laughs> great accolade to Mori's uh, artwork. So I'm going to talk about um, the structural aspects of GPIs uh, because that was really uh, where my main contribution was uh, in this field. So it's a little bit of historical perspective, and I'm, that means I'm not going to be really presenting very much or, or any, in fact, new data uh, as such. It's mostly a, a sort of overview. But before I do start, this is a, a, an EMBO global uh, lecture. <clears throat> and uh, just to remind everybody how grateful we are to, to EMBO for sponsoring uh, this meeting as well. So EMBO is a uh, a, a, an organization with elected uh, fellow members uh, across Europe and beyond. It, it is a funder. It funds uh, fellowships, for example, long and short-term fellowships. It's a publisher of esteemed journals. And, of course, since 2016, India has been an associate member state uh, of EMBO. And uh, that's one of the reasons why, in 2018, there are going to be a number of EMBO courses and workshops, which are some of the best in the world, incidentally, the EMBO courses and workshops, and um, of the one of the eight, I think, or nine that are going to be held in, uh, in Asia, uh, four of them will be held here in India. So it's a wonderful partnership that EMBO has uh, with, with India. So straight on with uh, the show, as they say. So first of all, some of you might be wondering what the hell are GPI uh, membrane anchors, since not everybody comes across them. Well, GPI stands for glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol. So in other words, a phosphatidyl inositol, or PI phospholipid, that's the pink bit, uh, linked via a glycosyl or sugar chain component to the C-terminus of a protein. That really defines what GPI membrane anchors are. And we should think of them as, as one of the uh, many mechanisms there are of anchoring uh, proteins to the uh, outer surface of, of cells. So GPI membrane anchors tend to reside on the, on the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane. So in this sort of textbook image, you can see uh, are the, sort of trans the sort of membrane proteins most of us are familiar with, which span the bilayer either once or several times with an alpha helix of hydrophobic amino acids, or indeed some proteins which are lipidated uh, and, and dip into the membrane from the cytoplasmic side. But uh, GPI membrane anchors are, if you like, a fourth class of, of integral membrane protein, uh, where all of the energy of association of the protein to the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane is through this complex glycophospholipid. So how does a protein get to have a GPI anchor in the first place? Well, it turns out that if you look at the amino acid sequence of all GPI-anchored proteins, they all start with an N-terminal signal peptide because they need to be translocate, translocated uh, across the endoplasmic reticulum into the lumen of the ER, just like all secretory proteins and glycoproteins. And then, in addition, they have at their C-terminus Another uh, peptide sequence that actually looks a little bit like an internal signal peptide, uh, which is a GPI uh, signaling peptide. So what happens is a protein which is synthesized uh, and sequ sequestered into the uh, ER with this C-terminal extension uh, sitting in the ER membrane then comes in contact with a completely prefabricated GPI membrane anchor, and then an enzyme called a GPI transamidase simply exchanges an amide bond to the uh, GPI anchor uh, and, and uh, a simultaneous excision of the C-terminal signaling peptide. So that's how proteins get to have this. It means that the modification is entirely predictable, and there are very good algorithms available where you can run any amino acid sequence through uh, these algorithms, and they will uh, predict for you whether or not your, your particular protein is likely to get this modification. So just to point out that typically for most eukaryotes, somewhere between 0.2 and 2% and of the proteome is predicted to be GPI anchored. So it's not an insignificant uh, post-translational modification. So what sort of proteins receive these kind of membrane anchors? Well, I'm going to start from uh, lower eukaryotes, the protozoa. In the protozoa, we find a number of protective coat proteins that utilize this kind of uh, membrane anchorage, and also uh, proteins involved in host cell uh, invasion, like MSP1 from plasmodium, the malaria parasite, for example. Then if we um, <clears throat> move along in the eukaryotic kingdom to yeast and fungi and, and dictyostelium, we find a lot of cell wall biogenesis proteins, a lot of adhesion molecules, and also 
Uh, GPI-anchored proteins are quite common in plants. Again, a number of them involved in cell wall biogenesis, one involved in pollen tube development, for example. And then going up to mammals, we find uh, a whole slew of GPI-anchored proteins, some of which are involved in, in for instance, complement regulation, like CD59 and DAF, decay accelerating factor, a number of cell surface hydrolases, alkaline phosphatase, 5' nucleotidase, and so on, are anchored in this way. A number of adhesion molecules, including the smallest form of NCAM, neural cell adhesion molecule, NCAM120, and so on. A number of interesting receptors, uh, and uh, a very topical one, the prion protein that causes uh, uh, mad cow disease, for example, uh, is a GPI-anchored uh, protein, and then also some extracellular matrix components. So a very wide range of proteins can receive this kind of uh, membrane anchorage. We are celebrating the 30th anniversary of the, of the determination of the first chemi full chemical structures of GPIs, not their discovery, actually, because the discovery absolutely uh, belongs uh, not to this group of people, but to Hiro Ikazawa from Japan and Martin Lowe, originally from the UK, but did most of his work uh, in the US. And the work that they did uh, was really uh, in the middle of the 1970s, and they showed that um, if they treated either isolated membranes or, in or intact cells with highly purified bacterial phosphatidyl inositol specific phospholipases C, then a, a, a small number of, of very specific proteins were, were, uh, were, were released from the, uh, from the cell surfaces. And this is a picture of Martin Lowe uh, here. And uh, very sadly, Martin uh, died in 2013, so I'd like this uh, meeting to commemorate uh, his memory. And this is a little cartoon that uh, uh, Martin uh, drew, actually, in 1985, when we got the first partial structures of GPIs together. And it appeared in a, in a sort of review article by Gina Collata in Science, and in, a, in the very first GPI review, which was published in the Trends in Biochemical Soci Sciences back in, in, in 1985. Anyway, I miss Martin a lot. He's a very, really generous and, 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 and kind man. So, they, so this was the original description, really, of this phenomenon of a covalent linkage between uh, proteins and uh, phosphatidyl inositol. But there wasn't very much structural information, and, and the term GPI wasn't coined then. It was coined later as more structural data became available. So there was a sort of key period between 1981 and 1985 when uh, a number of different uh, groups published uh, work which, uh, if you like, led up to, to, the, uh, to the discovery of, of these structurally. So Alan Williams's group, again, the late Alan Williams, sadly, who, who died in 1992, on rat uh, thigh one, uh, Israel Silman on torpedo acetylcholinesterase, uh, Terry Rosenberry's group on uh, uh, bovine and human erythrocyte acetylcholinesterase, and George Cross's group uh, on T. brucei, trypanosoma brucei variant surface glycoprotein. That was the work I did as a, as a postdoc, in fact. Now, I'd just like to uh, mention briefly something about Alan Williams, because actually um, he and I wrote a, a review on, on uh, this uh, then uh, a, a sort of a growing subject in 1988 for annual reviews of biochemistry. And Alan, uh, as, as some of you who may have known him, was a fantastic molecular immunologist. And um, he was also a very, very observant uh, person. And he noted that uh, even then, when we had a relatively small number of, of known GPI-anchored proteins, he said, you know, there's something really interesting about this group of proteins, the mammalian ones. He said, none of them are extractable in cold, non-ionic detergents. So we actually wrote uh, a little uh, couple of sentences about that in, in, in that review. And that was very prescient, because basically, uh, this is one of the characteristics of uh, proteins which are embedded in liquid ordered domains, lipid rafts or, or microdomains, the, th the things that uh, G2 Mayo will talk about uh, at the end of uh, the symposium. But I thought it was a wonderful uh, early observation just from knowing the literature well enough and saying, well, that's, that's really weird. None of these solubilize in Triton X100 in the cold. So, moving on, structures of GPI anchors and what they tell us. So, GPIs 101 is, well, how do you solve uh, an, un an unknown structure? like a GPI uh, anchor. Well, the trick really is to, first of all, select the right system to work in. And I was lucky to be working with George Cross and therefore working on the African trypanosome that causes human African trypanosomiasis or sleeping sickness. And it turns out that that expresses more GPI anchored proteins uh, in the form of its surface coat called the variant surface glycoprotein than any other organism. So the, the trypanosome has 
10 to the power 7 or what, uh, um, GPI anchored uh, VSG molecules on its surface. And it's also very easy to grow quite large batches of this uh, parasite by uh, infecting rats. So if you, if you infect a dozen rats, you get about uh, 1 to the power 11 uh, uh, parasites. So you can see 1 to the power 11 parasites, uh, 10 to the 7 GPIs per cell. All of a sudden, uh, each uh, preparation gives you about a micromole of, uh, of GPI anchors to work on, which is quite a lot. Now, in solving the first GPI anchor structure, actually, I calculated the other day that I purified over two grams of native VSG in order to, to do the work because the technologies we had back then were pretty uh, insensitive. So one thing I can say is that rats were harmed in the determination of this structure. So we have a, had a situation where we knew there was something on, attached to this variant surface glycoprotein that was giving it very stable association uh, with the plasma membrane, but we didn't know what it was. So how do you determine uh, an unknown structure? Well, it's quite easy, really. You, first of all, uh, break it into its component parts with a hammer, the hammer being something like strong acid hydrolysis. You take a look at the, you shake out the bag and take a look at what bits come out, and you identify them by various uh, chromatographic and analytical methods. So you can see here we've got galactose, we've got two fatty acids, two myristic acids, we've got some phosphate, we've got some uh, inositol and some mannose sugars, etc. Of course, you have to uh, remove uh, contaminants like Batman, who shouldn't be there, which is uh, always the, the problem in analyzing um, materials from biological uh, uh, sources. And then you need to start finding some associations, because I just showed you a, a set of pieces, and if you were to calculate the theoretical possibilities of how you could assemble all of those different pieces together, uh, it runs into the billions. So you have to, of course, reduce the structural uh, 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 ve potential variation down to a single uh, solution. And so the first thing you have to do is to start finding some uh, chemical associations between the parts. And I'm going to tell you very briefly about how this particular component, which is the glucosamine, the inositol, the phosphate, and the lipid, the diacylglycerol, how we uh, determine uh, that part of it. So here it is in, in proper chemical structure, glucosamine, linked to the sixth position of an inositol ring, linked through phosphate to glycerol, and the two uh, uh, fatty acids uh, attached there. So this is actually uh, the substructure which actually defines the GPI family of molecules. So anything that has this motif of glucosamine linked to a phosphatidylinositol is by definition a glycosylphosphatidylinositol or GPI uh, structure. So this is really the work that defined uh, the name of, of this group. So again, we start, we have a black box, we know a few things about it, we know, we know that there are fatty acids in there, for example. So a very simple experiment you can do is to treat it with alkali and see, whether, see what happens. And what happens when you do that is that the two fatty acids are released as free fatty acids. That tells you that you have ester-linked rather than amide-linked fatty acids in your structure. And so you can take one step forward. You know you have something with two ester-linked fatty acids. And that's suggestive of a phospholipid structure. So you can treat uh, the unknown with phospholipase A2 from snake venom. And that did indeed work. And it released one fatty acid. And that tells you that you do have some kind of phospholipid structure. Then you can uh, start collaborating with great Martin Lowe who, <clears throat> with his PIPLC enzyme and find that the molecule can be cleaved with phosphatidylinositol, specific phospholipase C, to release diacylglycerol. And that tells you that you have a phosphatidylinositol component. <clears throat> and lastly, we knew that the glucosamine in this structure was unusual in that it was not n -acetylated. And that allows you to, to do a nitrous acid deamination uh, reaction. And when you do that from the uh, unknown structure, you actually release intact PI phospholipid. So that tells you that the, you must have a glucosamine immediately uh, in glycosidic linkage to the PI component. So basically, in four swift moves, two chemical and two enzymatic, you can define this key component uh, of the structure. Of course, what I'm not showing is all the failed reactions that were tried out as well in the process of, of doing that. So you find some associations. You see there's still a lot of information missing, all of these carbohydrate bits, and those are horribly complicated to, to get right in terms of sequencing. But the best thing to do is, is find a really gifted uh, NMR spectroscopist like Steve Homans, and uh, Steve and I formed uh, a very powerful uh, collaboration and uh, completed not only this, but several other GPI structures uh, during the uh, end of the 80s and early 90s. So that's how we determined the first uh, structure, and we used the same methodologies on a number of other uh, molecules. And so what did we learn as we 
did more and more uh, uh, structures. Well, the first thing we learned is that GPIs in general seem to contain a conserved uh, core structure. And you can see that from the first two structures that were ever determined, the trypanosome one uh, shown here, and one from rat, from the, the rat thigh one um, anchor that we did in collaboration with, with Alan, uh, Alan Williams. And the pink zone here is the absolutely conserved core of ethanolamine phosphate, one, two, three green circles, which are alpha mano sugars, uh, non-N-acetylated glucosamine, and the phosphatidylinositol uh, phospholipid, although the, the lipids are, are, are variable between the, the species. So this suggested to us that these structures, the core structures, were conserved from trypanosome to rat, or from protozoan to mammal. And just to let me assure you, that's a hell of a lot further in evolutionary terms than yeast to man, which is one of my least favorite uh, quotes, because actually that maps out a tiny piece of evolutionary uh, space. So this was a very wide um, piece of, uh, of evolutionary distance. Okay, so what else did we learn as we did more structures? Well, we learned, for example, that the GPI core is substituted in a species and or tissue specific way. I'll show you some species specific ways uh, here. So these are four structures, all from trypanosomatid uh, parasites, actually, uh, from uh, Leishmania, from Trypanosoma brucei, Trypanosoma congolensi, and Trypanosoma cruzi. And you see that the, the two in the middle have, the, have, have diacyl PIs, that's uh, phosphatidylinositols with two ester-linked fatty acids, whereas the Leishmania structure and the T. cruzi structure have alkyl acyl PIs, where the SN1 position has an alkyl-linked uh, fatty chain rather than an ester-linked fatty chain. So there's good examples of uh, variation on the theme in terms of the lipid component, but also, of course, in terms of the carbohydrate side chains. So the Trypanosoma brucei one has the most fancy side chain, lots of uh, galactose residues, T. congolensi, a simpler one, a lactosamine, an acetyl-lactosamine unit, and T. cruzi, the smallest of, uh, of, of the three, uh, with a single extra mannose residue, and the Leishmania structure, no embellishments uh, whatsoever. So there's an example of, uh, of uh, species-specific a variation in, in carbohydrate side chains as well. So the other thing we learned uh, from looking at mature GPI structures is we discovered that some of the GPI core substituents are temporary and appear to be used as biosynthetic cues. So what do I mean by that? Well, on this slide we see two mature GPI anchor uh, structures, one from human placental alkaline phosphatase, uh, again from rat brain, uh, from rat uh, thymocyte thi1 uh, here, and then here's another structure over here from, uh, uh, from CD52, from uh, uh, human sperm, actually. And uh, you see that this structure has yet another extra ethanolamine uh, phosphate on this middle mannose. You, you notice that all of the mammalian structures, in addition to having ethanolamine phosphate linking to protein, have uh, one extra one on the first mannose, here and here. But this uh, particular one had yet another one uh, found on the middle mannose. And the other thing that it came along uh, with was an extra fatty acid attached to the inositol ring. This is known as inositol uh, acylation. So what's that about? Well, what we think is that inositol acylation and deacylation is a biosynthetic cue. So what it t in, this is a pathway largely taken uh, after Taro Kinoshita's wonderful work. But inositol acylation occurs here in, in, the, in the mammalian GPI pathway, and it must occur in order for the mannose residues to be added. In other words, no acylation, no manosylation, no GPI. So it's an absolute prerequisite for manosylation in mammalian systems. So it's a cueing, uh, it's a cue to say to the system, now you can add uh, mannose residues. But once it's done its job, it's actually taken off at this stage of the biosynthetic pathway. And when it's taken off, it enhances the efficiency of ER exit of the GPI anchored protein. Things can exit with it on, but they uh, exit much less uh, efficiency, uh, efficiently. So just anecdotally, there are some very interesting differences between um, inositol acylation in, uh, in mammalian systems and in the parasite system of Trypanosoma brucei. And this is work that, that uh, Lucia Guther and I published back in 1995, I think. So <clears throat> I've just shown you the human uh, situation. So here's PI getting an acetyl glucosamine added to it, DNA acetylated to glucosamine. It's then flipped from the cytoplasmic face to the luminal face of the endoplasmic reticulum. And the blue reaction is inositol acylation. And it strictly precedes the pink reaction, which is manosylation. And exactly the opposite is true in the, in the lower eukaryote uh, trypanosome, 
where <clears throat> manosylation, the first manosylation reaction, strictly precedes, well, the pink reaction strictly precedes the blue reaction in ositol acylation. And actually that gave us, uh, that told us that there, that there should be exploitable difference, differences between the human and the pathogen GPI pathways that might be exploitable um, therapeutically. And one of the, um, one of the exciting uh, outputs of this was I, I, I got so excited about the GPI pathway as a potential therapeutic target that together with my colleague Alan Fairlam back in 2005, uh, we actually created a drug discovery unit in our university. It's like a biopharmaceutical company embedded in the university in order to, to uh, progress targets like this and, and others that, that we were working on uh, through to drugs. In actual fact, none of the targets that either I or Alan were working on uh, uh, were any use at all for drug discovery, but happily other ones that we brought in from other colleagues were, and we did phenotypic screening, and we now have uh, drugs in clinical trials against malaria and two preclinical candidates for leishmaniasis. So all went well, but it just goes to show that you can never be sure in the, in the therapeutics area what's going to deliver and what, uh, and what isn't. Nevertheless, this was the inspiration for setting that unit up and as I say, we have a compound in phase one clinical trials for malaria at the moment, which we're keeping our fingers crossed on. Okay, so what about um, uh, other features that we learn from structure? Well, we learned from looking at, uh, at the mature structures of GPI anchors that the GPI lipid component can undergo substantial remodeling during its transit to the, to the surface. So we learned that by determining the, the structures of the GPI pathway by synthetic intermediates and, the, and comparing them with the structure of the mature products that ended up at the cell surface. So for example, Trypanosoma brucei has a diacyl glycerol uh, um, lipid component, and very interestingly, it's fully saturated, and both fatty acids, un very unusually, are both meristic acid, that C14, re relatively short uh, fatty acid. So very unusual dimerist oil uh, feature. Most mature mammalian GPI anchors have saturated chains, a saturated alkyl chain at carbon one of the glycerol and a saturated acyl chain uh, at carbon two. Yeast is particularly uh, uh, we weird in a way uh, in terms of its lipids. It, it has diacyl structures, yes, but they are extremely long chain fatty acids, C26, one of them hydroxylated, or some of the structures actually have a ceramide, again with extremely long fat C26 fatty acids uh, amide linked to the uh, long chain base. So very unusual um, lipids in, in yeast. And, but again, all of these uh, start off from biosynthetic precursors with, with pretty ordinary looking mixtures of saturated and unsaturated diacyl PI. So lipid remodeling has to take place between the start point and the end point. Now, I'm not gonna show you uh, the details of, of, of fatty acid remodeling for, for all three, but uh, I'll just concentrate on one. That's the Trypanosoma brucei one. Taro Kinoshita, I'm sure, will uh, mention quite a lot about the mammalian one. And that's in this, th 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 that comes from um, the rather well delineated biosynthetic pathway uh, of the African trypanosome GPI pathway. That was uh, really elucidated by many people, but the, the main uh, work was done by Wayne Masterson and, and Paul, in Paul England's lab. And in bold here, Anand Menon and G2 Mayo when they're in George Cross's lab and uh, Lucia uh, in my lab. So we know quite a lot about the, the fine detail of GPI biosynthesis in, in Trypanosoma brucei, and indeed most of the sort of um, uh, methodologies for, for studying GPI biosynthesis bi biochemically were worked out again in the trypanosome first. And in the red box is, is fatty acid remodeling. I'll show you that in a little more detail. And again, I'd like to uh, remember our close friend and colleague, Wayne Masterson, who died at the age of 31 of melanoma who really did so much to delineate this, this, this exquisite piece of biochemistry in this pathway. And really the, the remodeling, the fatty acid remodeling is an off-on, off-on mechanism. What do I mean by that? So you start from this uh, structure here, which has two ordinary type fatty acids, sort of C18 and C18 unsaturated fatty acids here. And the first thing is you take one of the fatty acids off, specifically the SN2 one, uh, flip it across the membrane, and then you add meristic acid on, then you take the other fatty acid off and you put another meristic acid on. So it's an on, off, on, off, sorry, off, on, off, on uh, mechanism uh, like that to, to create that remodeling. Interestingly, the, the precursor then with its meristic acids uh, flips back across the membrane where it can be added to the VSG protein, but it also goes back into equi equilibrium with inositol acylation here uh, and that leads to catabolism. So just to make the point again that 
in T. brucei, and also lacellation is a, is, is a biosynthetic cue like it is in mammalian cells, but it does completely different things. So an ulcerol acylation uh, in trypanosome is a cue for ethanolamine phosphate addition. You have to have an acyl chain here to add the ethanolamine phosphate right at the other end of the molecule. And then an ulcerol deacylation is a cue to enter the fatty acid remodeling uh, pathway. So it has completely different function. And then finally, an ulcerol acylation kicks in again as a cue for catabolism of excess GPI. So this an ulcerol acyl transfer and deacylation uh, reaction is very interesting in GPI biochemistry in terms of control points. So lastly, what does uh, GPI lipid remodeling uh, tells us something? Because GPI remodeling affects very much how GPI anchored proteins associate with other lipids and membrane components at the surface. And this is going to be discussed at, at some length by G2, so I won't say uh, any more. Now, after 30 years, we still have many questions remaining. For example, and not least, why is it necessary to have a glycan spacer between the C-terminus of the protein and the lipid component at all? Why not just link that phosphate straight to your lipid? I honestly don't know. Uh, I mean, this could just be phosphatidyl ethanolamine linked to the C-terminus of the protein, but the, the uh, eukaryotes seem to have gone to a lot of trouble to create these intervening spaces. So that's the first mystery. Uh, what, if any, are the function or functions of the species and tissue-specific carbohydrate side chains, like these ones that I'm illustrating in pink? We still don't know. And uh, what are the functions, uh, what is the functional functions of the extra ethanolamine phosphate group that we find in mammalian and higher eukaryote GPIs, but not in lower eukaryote uh, GPIs? And uh, why is lipid remodeling so important, A, but B, why do some GPI-anchored proteins appear to escape lipid remodeling altogether? Here's a good example. Human spleen CD52 uh, it still has an unmodeled, uh, unremodeled C20 with four unsaturated bonds uh, uh, fatty acid here. It doesn't have an alkyl group uh, uh, here, and it still has its inositol acylation. And yet, clearly, that quite efficiently is one of the major forms of CD52 from, uh, from whole human uh, uh, spleen. So just a note to G2, not everything um, is going to end up in, 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 in lipid-ordered domains. I'll skip that in the interest of time. And just finish with this uh, slide to ask the question, well, okay, are there, what are the sort of therapeutic opportunities from uh, 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 looking at GPI anchors in general? Well, uh, there's a biotech company in the States called Amplix, which has a GPI pathway inhibitor in clinical trials for fungal infections. And what does it do? It exploits the differences in the inositol acyl transferase, that inositol acylation reaction again, between yeast and fungi uh, and humans. And actually, it's looking uh, pretty good. So that's uh, very uh, uh, welcome, because as, as azole-resistant uh, fungi uh, start to uh, appear on the planet, we're in, we're in deep trouble in terms of antimicrobial resistance to the existing frontline uh, antifungals. So this is uh, very good news. Uh, perhaps we'll, we'll see some gene replacement therapy, because Taro Kinoshita is, is going to talk about uh, um, uh, genetic deficiencies in the pathway and the, uh, the uh, diseases that that causes. And then finally, actually from a biotechnology point of view, GPI anchors are a very useful tool for uh, immunotherapy type approaches because if you, um, you can splice on a GPI um, signaling peptide to, to any protein domain that you want pretty much, as long as it's not a transmembrane one, and express it in say CHO cells and have it expressed on the surface as a GPI anchored uh, protein and you can purify it as a GPI-anchored protein. And once you've done so, you can actually reinsert those into, uh, into other cells at will uh, by, uh, by diluting out the, uh, the detergent. So basically, you can paint any cell that you want with your pet protein if it has a GPI anchor on it, because it will reinsert into eukaryotic uh, membranes. So that's a, a pretty useful uh, uh, technique. And it has been used experimentally in a number of uh, cancer therapeutic uh, applications. So with that, I will stop and thank you all for, for listening. And I'd like to thank all of the many co-workers who I haven't acknowledged along the way, I'm afraid, because of the nature of this presentation. I didn't want to have loads of, uh, of references all the way through. But obviously, a lot of people are involved in determining um, all those structures that, that I showed you. And uh, uh, I'd just like to thank all of those for, uh, for making uh, such a, a fun ride for the last uh, 30 years of structure determination, although it's not the only thing that we do. Thank you very much. <laughs>